Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the first session of the Peace Tech Talks. It's a pleasure to have such a wonderful set of speakers and participants. Um, I'm Calypso Nicolaitis, a professor at the School of Transnational Governance, and I want to um, share with you the fact that these Peace Tech Talks are organized within the framework of a wonderful new program that we've set up at the school, the Global Peace Tech Hub, uh, which is run by my great colleague, uh, Michele Giovannardi, and which I have the pleasure of coordinating with Professor Andrea Renda, who is also on the call today. Now, our ambition uh, with this uh, program is to create a platform that brings together academics, practitioners, and stakeholders from the public sector, the private sector, so we can all talk and chat and exchange ideas um, from this big field that, that where we're trying to foster, foster really you know, creative policy thinking on how we can use technology to enhance peace and cooperation across borders, including links between Europe and the world. There are lots of outfits out there on peace tech. Um, concentrating on specific conflicts or comparing conflicts. At Global Peace Tech, we try to take a kind of macro perspective and identify patterns, identify the link between these technological intervention and global governance, and identify the role of different types of agencies um, in this whole process. So today, of course, we start with Ukraine. Um, and Ukraine is many many firsts in, in Europe and in the world, but I guess we can also say that it is the first conventional war in which disruptive technologies and digital platforms play a really key role, a collusion of world. So we're gonna ask about information warfare, strat strategies against disinformation and the use of digital platforms to fight war, build peace. Big, big questions. Um, and, and um, before I introduce our four wonderful speakers who will, um, three speakers and one discussion who will um, introduce the topic, let me just flag before we start that uh, we will have next Wednesday a second Peace Tech talk that will also be on a very pressing issue, this time the role of technology in asylum and including in reforming EU asylum policy. Again, a link with... Uh, with the Ukraine war, war but on, on a different uh, angle. So today we have four speakers whom I will introduce in turn as they speak. Um, we, we will have Alexandra, Laurie and Caleb and as a discussion, Hubert. I will give the floor to each of our speakers who will have between five and seven minutes to make a short presentation. Afterwards, Hubert will be the discussant for each of them. And finally, we will open to Q&A to the entire audience. So, you know, be ready to put your questions to us. Uh, and please your, use the chat for doing so. So we're going to start uh, with Alexandra Pregalinska, who uh, received her PhD in the field of philosophy of AI at the University of Warsaw, and until recently was doing postdoc research at the Center for Collective Intelligence at MIT. Uh, she is now the head of Human Machine Interaction Research Center um, uh, at Kosminski University and the leader of the AI and Management Program um, at a Harvard Law School doing research on AI robots and the future of work. And indeed, Alexandra, this is really the question I want to, to pose to you um, as you start our conversation. Given your work on the future of work seen through the lens of emerging technologies as well as uh, natural language processing, humanoid AI, social robots, wearable technologies, you name it, you're doing every interesting thing uh, on the horizon. So I'd like to ask you to start perhaps more specifically in your book on Collaborative socio Society, it's, it is called Collaborative Society, published uh, last uh, in 2020. Now in this book, you examine the emergence of an, a, a kind of new kind of social collaboration enabled by network technologies. 
Can you tell us a bit more on how could a collaborative society play a role in building cooperation and peace in the current conflict? How do you link your finding in this wonderful book with the Ukraine war? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Calypso, and thank you for welcoming me uh, to this um, very needed, I think, and very timely uh, session. Um, I was thinking about this question uh, for quite a while, as I have received it beforehand. So I'm, I'm trying to still make the best possible link, I think, between collaboration, well-perceived collaboration, and uh, the future of technologies for peace. Uh, I did prepare a presentation, a very brief one for you. So uh, if we could just uh, have it on the screen, I see it's already visible. If we could just turn to slide one for a second. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I will try to perhaps address uh, the issues that uh, Calypso has raised, uh, you know, through this uh, presentation as well. So I have called it collaboration in the era of misinformation. Um, obviously, it's not only the era of misinformation, it's the, it's the era of cognitive technologies, it's the era of emerging tech, uh, digital era, if you will, taken further than the previous digital era that we've experienced, uh, you know, during the previous two decades or so. Uh, but it is truly now, I think, in the moment when we're speaking very much uh, uh, a timely and important topic to talk about misinformation and its place in this uh, new digital era of its or its next step, uh, if you will. Uh, so if you could turn to the next slide, please, for a second, um, I will start perhaps with um, sharing a bit uh, on what's happening in my field. So Calypso introduced me very well, but I do work uh, in the field of natural language processing, which is a very important subdiscipline of artificial intelligence currently rapidly developing. It's, uh, uh, you know, the discipline that has experienced probably the most unprecedented growth within AI space. Uh, maybe the only one that is parallel to it would be machine vision and image processing, because these two seem to stand out within this big umbrella term of artificial intelligence. I think vision, so everything that is related to recognition of images, but also generation of images and everything that's related to language processing, text processing, text recognition, uh, Q&A and conversational AI. All that has been developing very, very rapidly over the course of the past uh, few years. Uh, we actually have uh, now systems that are so robust. Uh, they are called transformers, hence the image here. Um, and those algorithmic uh, systems are huge algorithmic bundles, in fact, uh, can do so many things for us, right? So they can generate poetry. Uh, they can help in various managerial work um, in uh, various types of operations. They can uh, support humans in um, generating images as well, actually, even though they were designed to process language. They can also compose music. Uh, they can finish a sentence that we have started. We can ask them to conduct a marketing research for us or a market research for that matter. They have also predictive properties. So they are very holistic, I would say, AI systems that can do many different things. And this is a chance, uh, but it's also, um, I think, a challenge in many uh, different ways. Um, and I think the challenge resides in the fact that we have this unprecedented growth, particularly in AI, but obviously we don't have to limit ourselves to AI. We can speak also about IoT, uh, blockchain, and other emerging technologies that seem to be finding its place finally in this big landscape these days and seem to enter interesting relationships with one another, right? AI plus blockchain, AI plus IoT. These are even more uh, powerful, I would say, combinations than AI on its own. But I think, um, you know, um, Currently, we cannot uh, look away from the fact that these technologies are also used for all the improper um, uh, goals and also for the goals that really allow to spread misinformation and disturb the public uh, discourse. So if we could move to the next slide, maybe I'll just uh, um, share with you one more hint, because I, I think that's uh, an important link. So the fact that we have artificial intelligence so rapidly developing is also accompanied by the fact that it's mainstreaming. And that's another important thing to be said, right? AI is no longer a discipline of experts. It's also a discipline where people, um, persons who do not necessarily know formal languages or code or program, can actually use artificial intelligence. We have all the low code and no code approaches to artificial intelligence, which are extremely promising and I think in many ways very beneficial because we've always had this barrier, right? If somebody does not program, 
it's hard to jump into data science or machine learning, be it for your organization or for yourself. But currently these barriers are being reduced. And I think that's in many ways great. But um, if I could ask for the next slide, it also leads to uh, potential disturbances, right? So this is probably an image that is no, not a surprise for all of us here. Uh, and I guess uh, most of us kind of expected it because we're talking about tech for peace, but we're also talking about misinformation. So obviously most of you already know that there were several attempts to create a deep fake of uh, Vladimir uh, Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, but also there were deep fakes of many other people created, right? And these deep fakes can only exist because we have huge advancements in uh, machine vision uh, and in image generation in terms of artificial intelligence, but also because we have accessibility, right? So many of the tools that allow for creation of deep fakes, be it a deep fake for text or a deep fake that is a video like this one here, are low code or no code platforms, right? So they are platforms that anybody can access and if they just have enough pictures or videos, they can create a deepfake of virtually anybody, right? And uh, this can pose uh, various threats, right? So as, as much as uh, I think I am super happy that we have all these low code approaches, we just have to address how to use them properly. And I do remember that actually there was a very interesting piece uh, in Wired magazine last year. It was about creating deepfakes for, people's, uh, for people in, regarding or in the context of porn movies, right? And Wired suggested perhaps this is something that we should look into and limit through regulations because that's not the proper use of deepfakes. You can have amazing usage of image generation for architecture, construction, also for humanitarian aid, to be honest. But on the other hand, you have all uh, these barriers reduced for all those misusages of a very powerful AI engines. And I think that's uh, very, very important. Um, and I wanted to link it to the question that Calypso has posed, because um, um, we have published this book. If we could turn to the uh, next slide, myself and my colleague, Darius Shimielniak, we have published a book called Collaborative Society two years ago. And actually, uh, it was published uh, a week before the pandemic had started. I know pandemic is long time ago, or so it seems uh, these days uh, with um, everything that's unfolding in front of our eyes. But we have published this book where we were trying to examine collaborative modes or patterns of, of work. Um, and we were trying to capture this essence of how we collaborate uh, through the power of emerging network technologies, but also artificial intelligence. And we were trying to combat somehow this notion of uh, um, sharing economy, right? Because sharing economy has been a notion that's been very widespread and very much, I think, overused. And we were saying perhaps it's not the best way to address what is really going on, but also it's not the best approach to kind of capture the best value that we can have out of collaboration. And we have argued that, you know, what we really are facing these days is not about sharing all that much. There is a lot of share washing that we've seen across different platforms, right? Um, there is a sharing that is confused with selling quite often, right? And this is not the same thing. But we've also uh, tried to say that sharing economy sort of limits the phenomenon of people collaborating, using technologies to do things together to, um, well, generate certain synergetic effects through their collaboration. But it's very much focused, when it's focused on economy, it doesn't really capture the essence. So if I could ask for the next slide, what we were in fact trying to say is that it's not really about the economy because the focus on economy really misses the non-monetary aspect of the changes that we are seeing. People are collaborating for fun. Sometimes they are collaborating just for the sake of being trolls. Notice that, right? Because they have the fun of disturbing the uh, public life in one way or another. They also have various communal rituals that are related to, um, uh, to uh, collaboration. And this is definitely not something that would limit itself to the monetary aspect, right? So we also not always have uh, a captured value, right? That we can um, see as a monetary value that is a result of collaboration. So we were trying to say, perhaps collaborative society is a better way to understand what is it that we're doing, right? And uh, more so, if I could ask for the next slide, we were also trying to say that, uh, you know, if we really wanted to put some order into what's going on, we can say that collaborative society is this sort of overarching theme that 
encompasses both everything that happens in more a capital driven domain, right? We have platform capitalism, we have uh, different types of collaborative economy ventures such as Tinder, such as Couchsurfing or TripAdvisor and others. But we also have more co cooperativist uh, platforms. And here, particularly now, I think in the Ukrainian context, we could speak a lot about online hacktivism in one form or another that becomes this very prevalent mode, really, of conducting, um, you know, uh, I would say effective ways of information sharing, but also information disturbing, right? That is happening um, as this war, you know, uh, lasts. It doesn't seem that this um, online war that is also conducted by hacktivists of different types is, um, uh, well, less important. Obviously, it's not as valid because the physical war is a war uh, where people lose lives and it's absolutely brutal. But this parallel conflict is, you know, uh, just as visible. And I, I think in many ways, it can be just as decisive as the as the physical conflict in many different ways. And also, it can last longer, right, because it's less tangible. So I think this is something to uh, mention, um, mention as well. Uh, so if I could ask for the for the next slide, please. Um, I was just trying to link, you know, what we have written in this book about different modes of collaboration um, with what we're facing today regarding the hybrid war, regarding various efforts to uh, conduct misinformation on the Russian side, but also mm, respond to the misinformation. Um, I have to say that I myself uh, participated in campaign of um, uh, sort of discovering and then sharing information about non-existing persons, deep faked people, who are apparently or supposedly um, really waiting for uh, Putin to step into Kiev, right? So there was a deep fake um, sort of profile on social media of a, of a teacher in Ukraine and yet another uh, influencer, a YouTuber from Kiev who are um, strong supporters of Putin and they would share consistent information about how Ukraine is awaiting um, um, Russians, uh, Russia's arrival in a way, right? So they were trying to create an image uh, of, um, let's say polarized Ukrainians where a big part of the society would actually be welcoming uh, Russia and Russia's assault to Ukraine. So um, I have to tell you that I've participated in this effort and it really went viral, right? It turned out that we have um, finally, I think, you know, through um, incredible brutality of this war, um, we have finally woken up, I would say, to really understand how prevalent misinformation is. And we started to find our ways or patterns to figure out how to go against it. How rather than just allow this information to be misspread or widespread, whatever, like disseminate all over the place, just say, hey, this is a troll account. This is something that does not exist. Take a look at it. You can even use tools to undeep fake it and then detect that it's really nothing that should be taken seriously because it's a synthetic persona that generates this information. So I do feel I'm not overly optimistic, but I would say uh, that we've finally um, started to wake up to the call of, you know, responding to misinformation. And I think these efforts can only be achieved uh, through uh, collaborative uh, patterns of, uh, of, of work and collaborative action. Um, and there is probably no other way around it. And if I could ask for the next slide, um, and this will be my last one, I promise. Yes. I know that I should wrap up. Um, this is a picture of my university back home. I'm now speaking from Harvard, but uh, my um, university in, in, in Warsaw is Kosminski. We've accepted 80 uh, refugees on the first day of Ukrainian war, and uh, they would station in the library of our university. They were provided help and everything. So I said, like, the, the real war definitely matters most, right? And saving lives in reality matters most. But I do think that through collaborative efforts, through awareness raising, through the fact that we actually wake up to the call of misinformation and um, guide one another, right? Uh, to check certain information, to verify information, that we actually build a collective response to misinformation, we can achieve great effects as well, right? So we can have AI being used to um, uh, counter the conflict, right? We can have AI for humanitarian aid, and that would be a very physical application of it. But we can also finally, I think, try to build um, certain collective patterns of reacting to uh, misinformation. And I think that's very, very important. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Alexandra. That was uh, fascinating. So I let you go over time and you were introducing really the topic Sorry. with before us and demonstrating brilliantly that um, if we combine social platforms and AI, um, of course, in, in a war, um, it is manipulated by all sides, but it can also be used for the better angels to, to do the right thing. And so on, to continue on this theme, um, I will, I'll now give the floor to um, our very own Lori Tirala, who, is, uh, who works here with us at the EUI School of Transnational Governance as the director for the European Digital Media Observatory, EDMO. Um, until he joined us a, a, a few months ago, uh, Lori was a partner and senior advisor at Milton, a public affairs communication consultancy, uh, and before that, he was working for in, in FinAir in charge of global and European public affairs. And Laurie has a long record of European policymaking, uh, working with the European Parliament, the European Movement, and as well as a special advisor uh, on EU affairs to, um, to um, our director, the uh, Alex Sub, Prime Minister of Finland at the time. And, and so, Laurie, it's wonderful to, to have you uh, at the STG, and um, Edmo is doing a lot of work right now around the Ukraine war to inform, to analyze, to dissect what is going on. Um, and so I, it would be great if you could address for us, um, in a kind of broader sense, the role of disinformation in this war. And what are the strategies that we have to counter it and that Edmo has been channeling uh, in this uh, terrible story? Laurie, the floor is yours. Indeed, thank you very much, Calypso. Happy to be here and uh, already learned quite a lot from Alexandra's very, very in inspiring present presentation. Indeed, I could say a couple of words first about the disinformation and, and, and Edmo, and then focus, as, as you said, on, on what we are seeing happening related to the, to the war, what kind of uh, partially new phenomena, and of course, just the, the sheer scope of, of the disinformation related to, to the war is, is staggering at the moment, the, the biggest we have seen in, in Edmo's lifetime, lifetime and, and how we are, we are responding to it. I also have a presentation, and I hope it magically appears. It, it did. Let's go to the first slide. Uh, as I said, first a couple of words about the definition or phenomenon. What I mean, what we mean by talking about disinformation. You, Alexander was talking about misinformation. We are talking, I, I guess, more or less about the same, but of course, the definitions are important. Disinformation here in this, this term meaning, meaning inaccurate or misleading information that is knowingly designed and promoted to either cause public harm or for commercial profit, which before typically now in, in, in war, war time, the, the public harm becomes the more, more obvious reason, but, uh, but we all, all know that the, for, for many purveyors of disinformation, the commercial profit rem remains a top motivator as well. Uh, we are not talking about illegal ac ac actions here. It's sort of the gray, gray area that's very, very difficult to legislate away. In any, any society, there is a code of practice by uh, negotiated between the social media platforms and the, and the European Commission that's supposed to form a, work as a form of self-regulation. It's being updated as we speak, but we all know that obviously there is a lot of disinformation spreading on, on for example, on, on, on social media at the moment, irrespective of, of this effort. Let's go to the next one. What obviously disinformation is not a new phenomenon as, as such. What's, why are we talking about it? now more more than than ever uh, of course it's also what what's what's a la, what expression is a la, a la mode but there are genuine changes lead, leading to the to the growing importance of disinformation in our public public debate and public discussion the most obvious one and i suppose the topic for for today's discussion is the changes in the information eco ecosystem which makes it so 
easy and fast to spread spread disinformation stories from one country to another globally across across language barriers even even cultural barriers then within many societies the growing polarization which of course differs from one country to another to a degree and and same can be said said for the loss loss of trust in in public institutions all of, uh, three of these compounded and obviously edmo as a project is not tackling with all of all of these it's a, it's a huge task for for any for any society to to try and tackle all three, three of these drivers what we're mostly talking about now is the changes in the information ecosystem and they're taking me to what edmo is simply put it's a platform bringing together fact checkers researchers journalists media literacy activists all across all across europe uh, it's a project funded by the european commission small small project but i would dare to say that quite a lot more important than the the size of it would would su suggest and uh, we are obviously dependent on the tens and tens of organizations in different member states doing doing the work daily and now focusing very much on the on the war as, as alexandra said it seems that the pandemic is already far away and uh, we just published our monthly report on disinformation from march and indeed during march you could see the disinformation related to covid going down in Europe at a re record pace. And now this information regarding the war in Ukraine is the, the dominant theme and more dominant than anything, anything that has been witnessed during Edmo's short lifespan. But if these are the, the words of introduction, what we are what we we are talking about first of all and what Ed, edmo is then cut to the my introductions main main topic so what we are seeing on the on the ground if you will regarding the war uh, here in the map i hope hope you can see, uh, see it what's remarkable about the map is how wide the similar stories are now spreading from one european country to another we have always complained that there is no European demos and you cannot create a European level democracy without the demos. But it seems that that has changed with the, at least with these types of disinformation stories. We see more or less the same stories pop up in every almost every member states member state. You will notice that Sweden has none. It's unfortunately it's not because Sweden would be free of disinformation, but we have no data from from Sweden as a Finn, I'm, I'm sorry to, to say that but you have more more or less the the same uh, same st stories pop up in every every country uh, obviously the secret US bio labs being being the famous ex ex example and then the Mari Mariupol hospital in the early phases of the war that the claims that it was actually not attacked and the, and the victims were actually Ukrainian act actors. Then a uh, very, very particular theme directed especially at one media outlet, CNN, relates to the repeated claims that they would be dis a distributor of fake news. So it's, it's, it's sort of a meta disinformation disinformation about an established media outlet spread, spreading disinformation. If we look at the big, if these are the big, most spread individual stories, if we take a look at then at the biggest trends we have now seen during the span of the war on the next slide. Nine trends. I won't go through all of, all of them. I'm, I'm sure you will you will have access to the slides. I, I hope after afterwards, if they are of interest. So most of these you have seen seen from the mainstream media. The 
claims that U U Ukrainians are Nazis, the leadership of Ukraine is, is, is Nazis, the justifications for invasion of, of Ukraine. Then some more particular ones that you may not have noticed because you have not so been in the, in the target, target groups, depending on where, where you happen to, to live in Europe, for example, related to the nature of Ukrainian re refugees, where in the, in the EU member states where we have a lot of refugees at the moment, there are stories about their, their violent nature or their, them being un, ungrateful, mis, misusing the, the hospitality that they receive. Then obviously the prosophobia, that is uh, a claim being being spread by also by Russian state state actors, and then the exaggerated negative financial and economic consequences for the for, for from the coming from the war and from the from the, the sanctions. This is obviously not targeted only towards Europe and Europeans, but also towards other parts of the world where, where fears of, uh, for example, food shortage crisis because of the war could lead to some, some countries to, to consider their, their, their attitude towards the war and, and the, the aggressor. So, these are the big, big narratives we see repeated. Now that the war has, ent has entered its uh, stage two, if you will, there, we expect to see uh, some new narratives. Obviously, one, one relates to the human, the, to, to the civilian casualties, who is responsible and, uh, and, their, and their numbers. But before I give over to, uh, to Caleb, one final observation on the la next and final slide is uh, I mentioned a new phenomena, at least new, new for me, is the so-called fake fact checkers. This is a concrete site, War on Fakes. In this screenshot, they have over 700,000 subscribers on their Telegram channel. And uh, it's obviously built with uh, know-how technical know-how and, uh, and media know-how and, and some, some resources. It functions really well. It looks like a professional fact-checking site, like any, any European fact-checking site until you start reading and you notice that there are some stories that, are, that may be true, but at least between them, a lot of pure disinformation disguised as, as fact-checking and uh, some claims some claims by authorities originate from here. Now I see Kalupsa waving, so I conclude here. Well, thank you so much, Laurie. Um, this was fascinating, the way you demonstrated to us that, well, in fact, we do have a European public sphere, sphere that everyone dreams of, except it's for fake news. And, and the examples are, of course, disheartening, which brings us all the way back to Alexandra's count how we counter this and we will converse about this but before we do i'd like now to turn to our third speaker caleb gichuhi um, who is an explorer of digital spaces for has been for a long time and researches various technologies to address election violence extremism conflict mitigation and he speaks to us from Kenya, where he has worked with different peace actors across Africa uh, to respond to violent conflict uh, through digital tools um, and, and does social media monitoring uh, to that effect, as well as com community building. So um, he, he is in charge at uh, Africa Lead. Uh, he's the Africa Lead of Build Up a global NGO working on fighting polarization and building peace online. So um, through the means that I was just describing and depolarization projects. So Caleb, I I'd like to turn to you now and, and ask um, about this NGO that you're part of, uh, working on emergent opportunities to transform conflict with these digital technologies. That, and now how could your tools that you're applying in your part of the world as the Africa lead be applied in the current conflict to build peace with digital platforms? Give us a bit of hope after Laurie's a slightly depressing presentation. Uh, we wanna 
we want to hear the bright side now. Um, so Caleb, the floor is yours. Um, thank you so much, Caleb. So and um, happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, so, so I think uh, one. I just want to approach this one from um, an outsider who has been, you know, experiencing the effects of the Ukraine uh, conflict. And I, there are a couple of things that resonated from me um, from the first uh, two sessions, uh, presentations by Alexandra and Laurie. And the, the early one um, by Laurie is some of the narratives that you know, um, he's been seeing in the work. For instance, the pro-Ukraine war propaganda on the ghost of Kiev, you know, we felt those narratives trickle into Africa in that conversation on social media, just to show you that, you know, when it comes to digital spaces, you know, the borders are obsolete, like they don't exist in how um, information is spread or even how propaganda is spread. And then also these other points that Alexandra brought up in terms of, you know, uh, um, use of artificial intelligence tools um, that can go, you know, either way in term, in, in a conflict, an ongoing conflict um, is something that we've seen, uh, you know, true to in the work that we've been doing. Um, so I don't have a presentation, but I'll just speak to a couple of things that um, you know, um, emerge for us in the, in the type of work that we've been doing. So we're a peace building organization that we try and look at technology tools and how they can be applied in these contexts and also explore how uh, malicious actors are using some of these tools. So a couple of things that we've been seeing um, based on you know, just, uh, you know, just uh, we haven't done like a deep in-depth uh, research in, into Ukraine, but some of the things that are emerging in that context that we've seen in other parts of the world, um, you know, just for us, they're just framing this context of, you know, the tactics seem to be the same, um, you know, in different conflicts. It's just that, the, you know, the, the, the geographies are different, but these technology tools have given, you know, actors the ability to, for instance, develop deep fakes. And you'll find those in, you know, in different parts of the world, and now you're seeing them in Ukraine. So one of the key things we're seeing, for instance, is the idea of coordinated and authentic behavior that is also similar to some of the conflicts that we've been seeing um, around the globe, where you have you know, either the use of bots uh, being used to deploy this disinformation, and then that either um, you know, spreads or is, is, it's, it's curtailed by um, uh, fact checkers. But one of the things that that spirals on that is also we've also been seeing is this idea of manufactured consensus. So just be, because the, the bots are being deployed uh, or, you know, um, you know, even if it's just human um, elements that are using uh, this content, what happens is they, you know, hijack those spaces and then it ends up being, you know, people thinking that this is a view of the majority while it's still, you know, it's just a, a, view, of, a view of the few who are either recirculating the content. And then the third one we've seen um, that also we've seen, for instance, in places like Ethiopia is this algorithmic profiling where as people are crossing borders, they're being targeted by misinformation. And we saw this a lot, for instance, with African immigrants who are crossing over to neighboring countries and they're being targeted with misinformation about where they could get help. So just specifically targeting the people who are escaping the conflict um, with information that, uh, you know, that can be harmful. Um, and the last one, Laurie, that you mentioned about these uh, fake fact checkers um, is something that we've seen as well in Ethiopia where, you know, somebody started a fake checker account, um, a fact checking account, fact checking account. It was legitimate for the first few weeks just to gain trust. And then it flipped to putting out propaganda. So just trying to, you know, to recruit. But one of the things when we're exploring these spaces, we are realizing that digital peace, bu or peace builders don't have the necessary tools to engage in these spaces. And what we are seeing um, is a lot of them tend to use um, off the shelf, for example, commercial social media monitoring tools. Now, the challenge with that, you know, as we all know, those are meant for companies that to monitor brands. But they, you know, you'll, you'll find peace building organizations trying to adopt some of these social media monitoring platforms to, uh, to understand tensions or polarization, um, which is very difficult. For instance, if you're monitoring a Nike shoe and how it's, you know, it's being sold on the market versus the tensions that are happening in a conflict. So, so what we've done as, as, as build up is to build a, a technology platform that does that, um, that uses machine learning to understand those spaces. And I was really excited when I, hear, when I had Alexander talking about how you know, artificial intelligence presents that opportunity. And, and one of the things we're doing you know, beyond uh, you know, what was already covered with Alexander on the possibilities of, of, of machine learning and artificial intelligence is exploration of the digital space to identify who are the the other voices that are not usually um, get their attention during conflict. And what we mean by that are actors who are pushing against um, harmful content, 
that don't belong to any institution, don't belong to any program, don't belong to, these are just individuals within a conflict that are pushing back. So for instance, when, when, when fact checkers put out the real information out there, the people who take that information and spread it out and push it beyond the network of the fact checkers, right? So who are those actors? How does machine learning and artificial intelligence help us as peace builders to identify those actors and amplify their voices? Because most of the times or majority of the times you'll find that there's a fascination with you know, the harmful content online. And it's, it's not to say that you know, we, there's no space for that, there is but it sometimes can overshadow those actors who are sometimes silenced by the overpowering wave of this type of content. So, so with that, uh, we've built a, a tool which we call Phoenix, and it's, it's a combination between you know, just bringing the peace building lens into, into technology and saying, how do we monitor for polarization? And you know, we have five archetypes of polarization that we use to try and understand this space is polarized, these are the actors of misinformation, this is how the information is spreading, these are the actors who are pushing back. Can, how do we amplify their voices? How do we, when you look at conversation on social media, how do we look at a, uh, a healthy conversation? Um, at what point do you know that you know the fact check is now working, is now kicking in? You know, so all these met like I, these uh, sort of things that I go um, unmentioned, but are useful for peace builders to understand and be able to respond and say, okay, we understand if we react like this, people are getting the uh, the information and they're responding and they're running uh, with the with the fact check. Um, so so that is one approach. And then the one very last quick one is this idea of digital uh, media literacy. And one of the things we are realizing also in the in the in this space is there is a you know there is an approach to digital media literacy where we're training uh, you know actors like we have seen we're seeing a lot of uh, you know those sort of trainings even right now in Europe around. How do you identify misinformation? How do you identify that you know this is a, a, a bot, this is a true, this is a human account and all that? And that's great because it, it equips people with the technical skills to, you know, to, to get into that space. But there is another layer that we think also needs to accompany that, and that is also the social aspect of digital media literacy. And that is basically it's in, it's embedded in, in social contracts. So how do people just um, you know, when, when we're thinking about uh, the social media space or the digital spaces, how can people be more responsible? Because some of these problems are rooted in privilege, right? So how do we move from just trading the technical to, okay, it's my responsibility to, you know, to protect the other or to be careful of, you know, so that it's not just Let's focus on the technical because we've, like Alexandra said, that can easily flip to now I have the skills, let me use it for the, for the negative aspect of it. Yeah. So yeah, so thank you for that, and um, yeah, hopefully to, to to get engaged in this uh, discussion. Thank you so much, Caleb, and including I'd, I'd love in the Q and A to hear you more on this Phoenix um, um, platform instrument, but it's also wonderful that you um, stress that technology is ne is never technical. It's political. It's social. It's about who's empowered and disempowered, and, and about social contracts. So um, and, and this is a crucial uh, reminder. So on this note, and thank you to the three of you for, for your contributions, I'd like now to turn to, um, to Hubert Etienne, who will be our discussant and who is a philosopher who has conducted research in AI ethics and computational philosophy for a long time at the Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris, uh, where he also does lots of things, lectures in AI ethics at Sciences Po, in data economics at HEC Paris, and, and at the um, ENA on digital regulation. But currently, he's coming to us from Harvard University, where he's a visiting fellow uh, and working there on social interactions, especially on the moderation of problematic interactions on cyberspace, our topic today. So, uh, uh, Etienne, Hubert, uh, the, 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 the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Calypso, for, for the invitation. Uh, thanks all of you for the great presentations. Uh, you all touched upon many very interesting points to me, so hopefully I will not cover all of this, but there's some uh, reaction I'd like to provide on, on, on some key uh, comments you made, uh, and I also have a few questions to, to go perhaps deeper and launch a discussion around this. Um, perhaps on Alexandra's uh, presentation, um, there's one point that seems interesting to me, which is that, so you mentioned uh, the GPT-3 that was developed by OpenAI, 
Um, I do not understand this question when they actually released GPT-3, but I remember when they were at the state of GPT-2, they were unsure about their decision to release it or not because they knew uh, that could lead to very uh, important consequences. So, um, but they, they still did in the end. Um, and a, a second point perhaps is that um, when you mentioned the deepfake, which is so another kind of technology uh, that was very, we were very afraid of in terms of misinformation propagation. And uh, I think it's important also to mention that the, the one you mentioned on the Ukrainian president is actually, uh, to my knowledge, the first one that is actually, uh, that could have been very impactful in the world. So we had this threat about misinformation and deepfake feeding misinformation for a long time. Because as you mentioned, um, 96 percent actually of the of the deepfake that were developed on the web were actually used for pornographic videos, not misinformation. So here is like, I think the, the very first example we have of a, a potential for misinformation. So that's just what I wanted to say around this. And I, I do have a question for, for you. Um, if we understand so that we have this challenge on the one side, uh, you mentioned DPT3, you mentioned deepfakes. So we do have a technical challenge um, to to address in order to uh, satisfyingly do something good about misinformation. Do you think this is only a technical problem uh, that could only be addressed by platforms? And if not, um, how can we actively collaborate around this? So perhaps the IDMO platform that was mentioned by, by Laurie is a good example of what we can do. Uh, how can we better work all together, uh, I mean, experts, civil society, efficiently uh, to provide like um, to provide solutions to, to these big threats and in a reasonable uh, time frame, mostly? So that's the question I would I would have for you. Perhaps I can just address uh, Laurie and, and Caleb and then you you all, uh, we can trigger the discussion. So Laurie, um, uh, I, I really like your presentation and there's something um, uh, I found important when you mention the difference between misinformation and disinformation. This is something we classically do. Uh, we tend to forget why we do so. It's uh, because um, most people who spread misinformation don't know they spread misinformation. Um, they actually believe in it. And so the intention behind it, although it's very hard to differentiate when we actually moderate platforms, uh, is very crucial, uh, a crucial element also because um, on the one hand, you have bots that do spread disinformation uh, and the technique to catch them is very different from um, addressing misinformation from people who actually relay something they believe to be true. So uh, I think this distinction is extremely important. Um, and there's another point you touch upon, uh, which I think is crucial here, is uh, the loss of trust in institution. Uh, there's actually a great book written by uh, Pierre Rosan Vallon a few years ago, uh, which called the, the Age of Dis Mistrusts. Um, and it's talking about how European and American don't trust anymore their governments. And how do we do politics in the age of distrust? That's his main question. And you also mentioned the fact that we even do have fake fact checkers. So in such a world when we cannot believe anything else, including institutions, uh, how do we rebuild trust in institution? First of all, institution can be fact checkers, can be journalists, can be governments. Um, in this chaos, what can we do? And perhaps starting by the authorities. Um, and finally, um, oh, and I also had a very quick question when you, you mentioned this spreading of misinformation across platforms in, in Europe. Uh, I was just wondering where, um, where the data come from in terms of like on which, um, which platform it comes from, because it's not equal uh, across all countries and it's not equal across all platforms. So just a, a small precision here, please. And finally, um, on, on Caleb's presentation, um, I was not aware and very worried about the algorithmic profiling that you, you mentioned uh, to target migrants uh, uh, across countries. That is extremely worrisome indeed. Um, and I actually had a question um, around the Phoenix platforms that you mentioned. Um, so if I well understood it, the goal is to identify dissonant voices and amplify what they say. And I was wondering, um, in some cases, I guess that should be extremely relevant. If you talk about the, the, the Snowden um, scandal, I guess, the first people who have been uh, relaying the Snowden scandal, like that should have been considered as misinformation at the beginning because it's so dissident that it's obviously misinformation uh, at the larger scale when we, when we actually moderate the, the content. So how do you distinguish um, from these small voices once you identify them, those who can actually be uh, trustworthy and should be amplified uh, and from the, the others? Thank you so much, uh, um, Hubert. It's um, 
a set of, of questions uh, which are really bringing us more to, towards solutions and identification. And I would like to, you know, give back the floor to each of you, but perhaps channel in addition a couple of questions that are coming of those coming in, and then we have more. But related indeed to the potential of AI uh, as a as a solution and not just the creator of the problem. Uh, one question has to do with whether if we need fact checkers for fake fact checkers and so on, you know, how, is, is AI usable in that way? Um, how far do we go in, in this loop? Uh, and also for perhaps here for Alexandra and Kali, both of them, um, you know, when combining AI and collective intelligence as the way forward, you know, how, how do you actually do that concretely? Uh, building on, on what you were saying before. So uh, on these questions, both from Hubert and from the floor, uh, I'll turn back to you and whoever wants to speak first. Now we don't have a, a, a given order. Um, Alexandra, I see that you, you've you taken... You, you want. I'm ready. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, I think these are awesome questions. And the one about like looping technologies against technologies, how for some types of deep fakes, we don't have any other solution than a uh, than another more powerful um, image generating system that can um, can uncover for us what is a deep fake, right? Because uh, we cannot rely on our sight here. Actually, um, President Zelensky's deep fake was so badly created that um, even uh, uh, you know, a, a regular user uh, of social media was able, I think, to detect that something was wrong. It was also inconsistent, right? So deepfakes work within a certain context. So I'm going to start with that question and try to link it with the questions that uh, Eucalypso mentioned. Um, and uh, to Hubert, I just wanted to say hello uh, to a fellow Cambridge inhabitant. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I, I do think that... Uh, you know, regarding uh, deepfake technologies, there is definitely the social context there that plays a role, right? So I think we can uh, try and avoid certain technological determinism here because why did this deepfake fail? Well, one question was that it was not so well done, right? The face was kind of numb. Um, the con way the information was conveyed was very unrealistic, very low, shallow voice and everything. So something was clearly wrong even to our sight and our ears. I think that's one thing. But we can imagine a situation in which this deepfake is very well created, right? Very well crafted. Um, obviously, there are plenty of images of President Zelensky everywhere online. So if you feed this network with huge amounts of um, images, maybe, you know, the uh, the gestures and the mimics of the face could be a very um, uh, realistically rendered. But uh, what was missing was the context, right? A, a, a weird moment. Um, whereas we see and hear everywhere that Ukraine will not stop fighting, we have a, a uncontextualized video of the president saying that he would surrender. So there was no um, embedding sort of in the real environments. I think what is scarier is a situation where the deepfakes will be very well linked to the social context. AI is blind to that. But humans who use it, who use it, could be right less blind to it, and could be actually much smarter in uh, kind of putting that video um, online in a situation where actually it looks like a realistic um, um, consequence of something that's been happening. So I think. Oh, I guess. <laughs> All right. Let's 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 continue. Let's continue. Let's continue. Let's continue. Um, uh, anyway, so uh, this is this is, I think, something that is uh, quite relevant to mention, right? That technologies are indeed very, very uh, social in that respect, um, and I think that also resonates with the questions that were answered by uh, by you, Uber, uh, The questions regarding GPT three. Well, um, I have attempted several times to trigger GPT three to say very nasty things because I just wanted to test it. I just wanted to test the limits of it. And I succeeded plenty of times, right? So obviously we know there was this uh, lurking accusation that it's a deep fake for text. We should um, prevent it from um, being uh, accessible to everybody. But in the end, even better engine became widespread, no wait list anymore. Everybody can access it. So I think, you know, 
obviously the the company OpenAI has tried to prevent it. So there are many situations where you uh, have to agree to stick to the guidelines. You cannot misuse it. Your usage of it will be registered and monitored. So the company is doing its own work, right? But on the other hand, trust me, I asked GPT-3 what it would do if it became a robot assassin and it said to me that it would kill the person that regulates artificial intelligence. And I have this screenshot even, right? So I mean, you can you can force technology, right? So you can have certain guidelines, you can, you can have the framework, but ultimately I do believe in good habits. And I think the only way uh, to work with this whole situation. I'm happy to give the floor to my uh, co-panelists because I think they can also share a lot about that. But honestly speaking, I just feel only good habits and a big awareness and high technological skills. Uh, so certain democratization of AI, which is not equal to just low code. Low code is easy access to artificial intelligence. Democratization of artificial intelligence is being able to use it combined with good technical skills. I think that together kind of is an important um, is an important framework. So. Uh, I do believe that there will be violations of different technologies. And I think we have to understand it and agree with that. And we cannot just think that it's a technological problem to solve or fix, or even regulatory problem. Um, Facebook has been trying to tackle misinformation for so long. The first thing I see on my social media bubble when I enter the social medium is this one person from a huge crowd of my friends that posts pro-Putin uh, misinformation. How do I see it? Well, because the engine works this way, but I can do something about it as even as a user, I can just numb this information. I can um, decide not to comment on it, not to make it even more widespread. I can decide to report it. So I think really good habits and like true democratization of artificial intelligence are good solutions to a, a realistic, very social and political problem, not a technological one. Yeah. Well, thank you, Alexandra. And sorry for this little uh, hiccup. Um, but in any case, very, very uh, importantly connected to Caleb's point on algorithmic literacy and the importance of the social contract. And again, that it's, it, humans still are in this game. So perhaps, Caleb, I, I might turn to you uh, to on this connected point and the question also um, that Hubert asked you. Yeah, totally. Um, so I... I, I... I agree. I think the idea of democratization of artificial intelligence explores that ap approach in terms of how do, do we not just focus on the tech and say this is a tech solution, but also involve like the behavior aspect of humans of, for instance, how do we um, do a, more of that either reporting or flagging or some of this content so that it's not just the machine trying to do all of that, but it's also this human element that tries to say, there's a, there's a, there's a reasoning behind that. I'm protecting my community. Um, you know, by not pushing this forward. So there's, that, there's a linkage there so that perhaps needs to be strengthened through this approach. Um, and, I, and to respond to Hubert's question about um, Phoenix, um, so one, the, the conceptualization of Phoenix was one to help its builders understand the digital space um, because we've seen a lot of work happening in academic uh, circles, but then peace builders did not have the skills and the capacity to, you know, to engage at that level. Um, and, and especially coming from traditional peace building where efforts, you know, were mainly face to face and then switching over into the digital space, the tools um, that exist or existed earlier were not as, you know, useful to navigate that space. For instance, how do you do conflict analysis in, you know, in a digital space and get the same level of depth that, you know, you would get, for instance, if you're trying to do it offline. So, you know, so it's not, uh, you know, it's apples and oranges, but it's just trying to think in that space, how do we get into that space and understand who are the spoilers, who are the, you know, who are the actors who are trying to push these narratives. And then that shapes the interventions of the peace builders to, to navigate those spaces. So that they're not shooting blind, they're not just deploying, um, uh, you know, alternative narratives or, or you, know, you know, countering misinformation or disinformation without really knowing, you know, how, how does it spread, for instance, online? Um, who are the propagators of this content once it's, you know, once it gets to a network, who are the distributors of this information? So getting a grasp of that space and an understanding then helps them build the tools and the, you know, and the interventions that then can engage in that space. So that's just wanted to, 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 to you know, to talk about that briefly. And, you know, for the Phoenix is more of a process than a technology that works with local peace builders 
to say, one, this is what we are seeing. You just don't deploy the tool and say, this is what your social media network looks like. But it's more, what are you seeing? What are the narratives you're hearing? Based on, like, like Alexandra said, she opens up Facebook and she sees this type of content. So in a context of that uh, conflict, um, or in a, in a situation like that, those are some of the uh, some of the things that we pull into Phoenix, so that as um, as you're deploying the tool, it's carrying the local context to be able to say, okay, this is not Kenya, this is not Ethiopia, this is Ukraine, um, and then that also enables the actors to have a better in that is not just top level. What is trending? What is a hashtag? Um, but to jump into um, the question about how do we identify who is a trustworthy source, especially when some of them are pushing back into against these narratives. There's a program we ran in the US called the Commons, and the Commons was trying to model um, depolarizing conversations online. And the idea was to get into conversations that are highly polarized and try to depolarize them. We have an approach to that. And then the people who started to engage um, in those conversations were then recruited or asked to join a Facebook group to continue the conversations um, further outside that space and just have a, a further conversation um, and even be part of that approach if they were interested. So, so bringing that knowledge of, okay, this is how conversations look like when they're polarized. And then this is how conversations, as they start to depolarize, these are some of the characteristics that emerge. Then you can start to put two and two together and say, okay, this, this has a high chance or high uh, 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 possibility of being credible based on how they're responding, based on how they're engaging. And then also there is, um, you know, a, a, based on just even historical engagement with content that is either polarizing or, or you know, or harmful and saying, okay, this actor seems to be pushing a lot of the uh, fact-checked uh, fact -checked information outside to, to their networks. Um, is this a common trend? Is this something that has been happening? Um, or is this just a one-off because tomorrow there'll be something that they don't agree with and they will, you know, perhaps stifle it. So trying to also understand those um, uh, patterns of what, what does a healthy conversation look like then puts us closer to getting a more reliable um, uh, middle actor, we call them middle actors because they're trying to bridge that divide um, to, you know, to engage in that space. Yeah. Kelly, it would be perhaps uh, just to push you a bit here because mm -hmm. you're talking about the comments. Um, there's also a question about uh, electoral, harmful speech in electoral violence and how to address it, which is very connected. Um, but then these are kind of conflictual situations in kind of steady state. Um, yeah. So I was wondering if, if, now how do we apply it to questions, to, to context of intense conflict? Um, you know, do we imagine equivalent of the commons to, to have different sides speak to each other you know, in conflict? I mean, how do you depolarize in conflict? What does it even mean? On the other hand, of course, we know about the such the, the important role of, of, of platforms um, that are shared by both sides in the Ukraine conflict, whether it's Telegram or TikTok, um, by millions of users who see the same platform, but maybe different bits of, the, of that same platform. Um, so is there, the question would be, you know, do we, how do we extend these, insights to, for instance, the current stage of, of intense conflict in Ukraine? Can, can these platform be used to connect both sides? And perhaps also Uber might have a, a comment on, on this. Yeah, thank you for that uh, question. So um, from the work that we've been doing, um, if we're applying that in the context of Ukraine, um, right now, when we look at that context, the space um, that exists there right now is for mediation, um, but very little space for peace building in that approach that I was sharing earlier. Because of, you know, like you just talked about, this is top typical of active conflict when there is the conflict is actually going on. And the space for peace building usually comes in the aftermath and um, trying to, you know, build the relationships, trying to build the, the community um, after that. So, so, for instance, in, in South Sudan, when there was active conflict, um, the, the United Nations mission in South Sudan deployed a mediation program that was bringing the, the political leaders that could not see eye to eye, could not even be in the same room, using a digital platform. So they actually rolled out a digital mediation program. And that the, 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 if, if we, what we realized is that the affordances of of the platform made it possible that these leaders could actually engage in that space. And then after the mediation uh, process uh, had happened, then these other, these other approaches were able now to take shape. But in a, in a space where there is active conflicts, for instance, 
you know, that's why we're seeing a lot of migration. A lot of people will be moving out of that conflict and trying to bring them into a conversation and say, can you engage in a conversation like the commons? It's a bit, you know, uh, difficult in that context. So, so in terms of an active conflict, um, we explore first approaches of mediation. And then after that, uh, when that, the, uh, when that uh, is successful, it now creates the ground for these other approaches now to take hold. But um, just to say that it's, you know, it's, it's a very short time frame in terms of how one ends and the other begins. So that's not like a, a protracted, it is a protracted period, but the gaps are, it's just these are two connected processes that um, yeah, um, take, take shape in, in a conflict like this one. No, thank you. I mean, there's uh, wise issues on, I mean, you have to sequence even in that space yeah. where really time is accelerating, conflating, and everything happens at once. Um, yeah. But And I'd love to hear Alexandra's and Uber's uh, uh, um, um, response also on this issue. But now I'd like to turn to you, Laurie. Um, a number of questions had be, have been uh, mm. uh, p p posed to you, so please. <laughs> Sure. Thanks. And uh, I think both both Caleb and Alexandra, uh, from their perspectives, touched upon the, the similar issues as well, also talking about the de democratization of, of AI. Because when Uber's question concerned the, the loss of trust in institutions and the age of distrust, which is a term I can't, I don't know if I can say that I like the, the expression, but I think it's a, it's a very very pointy, pointy expression, but that's just the, the it that as a society we don't want uh, either public authorities or private companies, social media platforms to act as the ministries of truth. And also because how technology has evolved, how, so, how, how our societies have evolved, it's not even possible, it's not even feasible. Any authority trying to take on that role would ultimately fail and which is why i understand fully well the reluctance of uh, for example so social media platforms to take on that that role we all know that they have been rather reluctant to, to take on this this role which has been demanded of them by by the policy policy makers you asked, asked about the the role of the platforms there and 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 how we we measure measure do the map how we measure the spread of of disinformation uh the the map that you saw was just based on on stories ap appearing in in traditional media and that's that's just the the big issue i didn't get to it in the in the presentation because it's a topic for another seminar i guess the the access to data of, of what's what's happening within the big big social media platforms that's obviously something that researchers uh, mostly don't have and uh, the it's the mostly the companies themselves that know what's what's happening within how their algorithm work and, and what what's actually happening in in inside this is something that has been discussed between also between edmo and uh, and the platform companies during during the war quite quite in, intensely during the past few weeks and i think there is a possibility for some some progress and it would be very very important also for for developing what 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 caleb was talking about i, I think it i would imagine that understanding how the social media algorithms actually work would make it much more much more feasible to actually promote those who are spreading fact-checked information in, instead of of disinformation. Then I had from from Calypso, sorry, uh, the question on the role of AI in in fact checking. We just had a, of, of course, it's a fast evolving topic. I'm not a deep expert on that, but we just just had a, a re study published by our colleagues from the universities of Up Uppsala and and or or who's on the on the role of AI in fact checking. Happy to share it. Uh, basically, their conclusion so far is, which I'm sure is uh, quite familiar to, to colleagues, that it's a companion, it's a helpful tool, but will not not replace the human element completely. I don't know if you agree. Are you? Does anyone want to address this question, and and perhaps also uh, the, the more 
general question of whether AI and collective intelligence can can help us address um, some of these peace building challenges and how early in the war that can happen. Um, so maybe I turn now back to um, Alexandra. Did you want to? Yeah, well, I mean, I, there were plenty of different things that I wanted to touch upon, I guess. Um, regarding humanitarian aid and artificial intelligence, I, I think the potential is uh, really huge and that would apply to all types of systems, those that process numerical data, those that profile and target in an ethical manner, but also those uh, that recognize images, right? Uh, for instance, to connect displaced families with one another, uh, uh, generate information, right? About people who are uh, found. Um, and I, I do think that, uh, you know, uh, also systems that could possibly somehow target what kind of help is needed to create some sort of prediction layer, um, uh, it, it's very important. And I think that can be done, right? And uh, I know there are applications of that kind already existing in healthcare where we're trying to predict, you know, what could happen and how would be, uh, what would be the most efficient and best way to provide help for a person who might need it, right? So we have this model that acts sort of as a predictive layer. And I do think that that is absolutely scalable to issues of humanitarian aid. And we've seen a pre unprecedented growth of AI in healthcare over the course of the past two years in the pandemic. How about transferring some of that to humanitarian aid? Not all the problems are the same. Obviously they are different, but there are some significant overlaps. So I would say this is like a sort of a call to action because that can clearly be done. Um, but I was thinking also about the, the things that my co-panelists have shared. And for instance, Lauri mentioned, you know, uh, uh, certain call to action to the social media platforms, right? And in what extent, to what extent they can act? Well, um, uh, only I think uh, very tough regulation could make that work because the calls to action have been happening over the course of the past few years so many times. Um, and I think part of that is not like really only the unwillingness to do that. The other part is that it's very hard to do that, right? It's very hard to really create a system that is not going to be a failing one. For instance, in the context of combat and artificial intelligence, we're talking about systems that cannot fail at all. And there are some other contexts that we're talking about where AI has to be 100% reliable. Well, in social media, there is no obligation to 100% reliability. And we don't even have a, uh, an answer to the question what that would mean, right? Having, into, uh, having in mind the fact that they've been really trying to push this uh, fact-checking agenda forward and um, to a large extent still still failing because there are more and nuanced, more and more nuanced ways to really uh, trick them, I think, in one way or another. But um, I was just always thinking that if fact-checking was as easy as liking and loving something and emoticons, if it was part of the playful and gamified feature of social media, perhaps it would be more widely used, right? And it's a kind of, it's not really a solution to the problem, but it's the part of habit building that I was uh, having in mind when we were talking earlier about, you know, how to raise awareness and uh, create truly democratized AI. So sort of, that's something that's been on, on my mind for, uh, for a while. And, and having that said, maybe the last thing I would add is that I wouldn't shy away from more pluralism in terms of AI tools and social media platforms for different problems. So if Caleb mentions problem solving like in a very specific domain, right, peacemaking, um, I, I just feel that it's one of those domains where um, you have to build a certain inventory that works for this type of problem. And I, I am hoping that we will have more pluralism, that we will have many AI enabled tools rather than two or three, right? I mean, that we have for all country, conflict information distribution, we just have Telegram for all other things. We have other types of social media platforms. Well, it doesn't have to be like that. Thankfully, AI is very scalable to a large extent. It's still open source. So I, I, I do think that, you know, there are certain issues in terms of peacemaking, for instance, humanitarian aid as well, and like um, information. Uh, sharing and information exchange, right? That cannot go through open platforms where we um, it can gen generate more, more systems, right? And maybe they will become a foundation for something larger that they were initially designed to be, but I would not shy away from pluralism in terms of tools. I think that we are sort of like, if we're ready in terms of digital skills, we just don't have to rely on two or three tools that are sort of uh, a default for everybody. So that would be uh, my point to that. Thank you. Okay, so uh, in, in, this is in part your response to the one of the questions coming up uh, of someone working in, in natural language processing and saying, you know, could 
it, it, could we be going too far given the information hazards uh, with re there that, you know, if you publish everything, full genome and viruses, uh, deep fake, et cetera, you know, uh, MAD um, uh, is, may not be the only the, a valid approach. Um, so how far do you, how, how do you combine regulation education uh, to, to kind of, to, to deal with that, that these information hazards? And that's what you were speaking to Alexandra to some extent, but maybe you can say a bit more. Mm, well, I, I'm not entirely certain if I uh, understand the question perfectly well, but um, my thinking is that there is a lot on the horizon, both technologically and societally, right? If we are, for instance, looking in the space of encryption, if we are looking into the space of private computing, if you are looking in the space of minimal data approaches, right? I mean, we have designed certain patterns of interacting with technologies and building them that have proven to be effective over the course of the past decade, right? But um, certainly new approaches are on the way, right? You can think about different designs, different stacks and different toolkits for different types of problems. What I'm saying is that we can escape from um, you know, sort of an approach where you have one or two giants building a big thing in technology and everybody else relying on them. That's, I guess, sort of my point here. And, you know, we have GPT-3, but we also have GPT-J, an open source version of it. And we will have probably plenty of other generators. Some will be very well fed with data, some less, but they can still be reliant for many different things. So I guess I'm advocating for a pluralism for the sake of kind of understanding what where those technologies can take us if, if they are more widespread and diverse. Sort of that's, that's I guess, um, my response. Indeed, thank you. I mean, I'd like to go back to you, Uber. I mean, you've had some replies to your questions. Uh, what do you think, and including on this question of uh, how, how much can we use these um, depolarizing um, technologies in, in times of war and not only in conflictual societies? but also anything else that you heard from the speakers in response. Uh, first of all, thanks, uh, thanks to all of you for your great uh, answers and uh, very precise. Uh, in terms of depolarization, um, I, I think it really depends like the kind of tools we use because it can be extremely dangerous and uh, we can go for just like trying to avoid the radicalization of some people to just driving the whole society to one a different equilibrium so like nudging the whole society towards something that becomes very paternalistic so uh, i think it's I, und I do understand it is important but i also think it should be uh, used very 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 carefully um there's perhaps one point i'd like to come back on um what alexandra said about um, the fact that users usually have on social media like the only means they have is re the reporting feature and uh, it's also important to understand, so as, as we mentioned, that it's extremely, it's not only the reluctance of the platforms to, 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 to address this, because they also do and do a lot of work in, in this direction, but it's extremely complicated to do so. And it's, it's becoming more and more complicated because even user reports are being weaponized by some group of people who use it to censor other group of people and like shut their voice up. So um, the whole, game, if we can call it a game on misinformation, is an adversarial game with enemies and allies. And this is ex extremely complicated, both from a technical point of view, but also from um, when we need to take actions on it. And uh, there's some research that show that even when fact checkers publish something saying this was for, um, this is a, for, uh, a fake news, two weeks later, people actually remember the main claim, but they don't remember that it was a fake news. So even when doing so, you're being contra counterproductive sometimes. So like the whole issue is extremely complex. And um, perhaps you can, if I can just finish with, um, uh, I don't know if it's an, a reflection axis or a question, an open question for everybody, but um, I came to the conclusion recently that perhaps when we talk about the post-truth post worlds uh, we're living in or we're going to live in with the sophistication of this, uh, of, of deepfake and, and other um, GPT-3 and other tools that can serve this kind of, uh, of ends, I thought perhaps uh, we may live in a world where trust doesn't have the same meaning as it used to be uh, for the better or for the, for the worse, I don't know. But it doesn't mean that we live in, in the post-trust world uh, because we need to trust. We cannot rely anymore in all kind of information that we used to be. We are much more critical between this and like the difference between critical mind and nihilism is very thin. But we still, we still believe in people. We still trust specific sources of information when they're personalized. And so 
I hope at least if we are not, uh, if we don't rely anymore in information institutions, perhaps we will develop more trust towards specific individuals and source of authorities. I'll leave it to you. Well, that's a provocative thought and perhaps something Laurie would like to um, uh, respond sure. to. Um, and then uh, Caleb, I'd like to turn to you also to please pay, perhaps say a bit more on, on Phoenix and on how it deals with these tensions and, and difficulties and possible counterproductive uh, empowerments that will end up um, letting people remember fake news, for instance. Of course, not surprising if it's pornography, just a joke. Um, so, uh, Laurie. I don't know if it's a provocative thought. I, I think it's a very positive thought and one that I, to a large degree, do, do share. And 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 do and I think we do re need to remember going back to the motivations for putting together the, and and spreading this information, either commercial benefit or or bringing harm to the society. That often the the goal is not to actually make people believe in this information. It's enough sometimes to create exactly what Hubert was talking about the, the nihilistic approach that. Nothing is true. No one can be trusted, and that may be enough for for those who who are, who are trying to erode the, the the trust within our societies. And that's obviously something that we need. I, I mean, mean that's the whole point of of the of the exercise. Why, what we need to be fighting against that that er, complete erosion of, of trust within our societies, which would create the path to different types of conflict. Well, thank you. And, and I guess the question back to both you and, and Uber and all of you is whether, you know, AI systems who can help uh, uh, recreate a kind of trust allied with literacy um, and whether um, it, who, who can say, who can detect hate speech uh, and disinformation in addition or with AI system but also in this whole story, we need the freedom of information. So can these systems also, sorry, and freedom of expression, freedom of information, can, can the AI systems also do that? Um, perhaps I'll turn to Caleb now to, for you to tell us a bit more about how Phoenix, but also your broader experience in the, in the local conflicts um, can deal with these, um, these loops and these um, potential counterproductive tensions. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> and I, I, I appreciate the example that Hubert gave um, in terms of fact checking and then coming back two weeks later and realizing that people remember the information, but not necessarily that it was false. And, <clears throat> and I guess that's, that's, that's what we are trying to understand when I say exploring the digital landscape. Because if that was, uh, that was to happen offline, perhaps the, you know, the reaction would be completely different, right? This is false and you tell somebody, explain to them, there's a trust factor, the fact that you're talking to them face to face, but in a digital landscape, things completely change. And understanding how fact checking, for instance, works and what really works, you know, and I, I even just connecting to Laurie say, who says, is it the nihilism part that we're aiming for? What's the end goal? Is it that this information stops to spread? If that's the goal, can machine learning help us to understand what's the best approach based on the approaches that we're doing, is it working? And how do we keep on iterating to get to a point where the output is ideally what we want? Because I feel like sometimes um, the work that we've seen is fact-checking set, uh, you know, desks or uh, centers are set up in a country, going through an election, going through conflict. And the work is to just di disseminate the information. You know, it's a fact-check, disseminate the, you know, the information that they have. But once it gets to the online space, you know, what happens? Do people believe it? You know, what makes it believable? Is it the institution? Is it another factor that, you know, I took it and I shared it with my family member? So there's an added trust layer beyond the fact checker. So once you understand, once you start to understand how far that fact check goes or what, the, what is the impact or, or how it, it's turning in that space, then we can reverse engineer and say, okay, at this point, this is the, this is a flip point or, you know, this is the point at which we start to see the change that we want to see or the, you know, the, the, uh, the outcomes that we are trying to get. So, so with the idea of building Phoenix, 
is to get deeper into that space. First, to understand whatever we are doing right now to try and understand whether, for instance, we, you know, we, we've seen in the past like counter messaging doesn't necessarily work, right? And but then what's what's the next thing, you know? Or or in the instances where people have claimed that it has worked, what what was the what was the thing that we were missing that machine and AI can help us? pick out, you know, for instance, when they were, I, I like the example of where AI has been used to identify cancer in patients where doctors were looking at five factors, but AI came and said, wait, there are these other three elements that you're missing. So can machine learning help us to explore the digital space in a conflict setting and tell us we are doing it wrong or we are doing it right, but the reason why it's working is not why we think it's working. That way we are able to, you know, to iterate the fact checking approaches that we have and maybe work with the you know the you know the actors who are pushing it further and give and giving the trust that is lacking in the institutions so just you know just thinking out broadly in you know in like in a macro um and yeah so that's what we're currently testing in terms of addressing those challenges that exist in the approaches that we're currently doing but can this be done in real time better uh, if we try uh, as we are sl slowly drawing into a close and as yeah. we see the ukraine war is not uh, sadly very close to finishing um, and how of course this parallel war uh, on platforms and in the digital space and landscape that you were just um, yeah. uh, t talking about I mean to what extent can any of these lessons it is happening there is mm -hmm. there is pushback in the Ukraine context you've been giving examples but um, if we're looking at the next few weeks perhaps month uh, what more can be done uh, including by the organizations you're all connected to, mm. um, specifically on the Ukraine in real time. Um, as I think we're all agreeing in this conversation that we are looking to the long term when there are options, there are mm -hmm. horizons, there are ways of um, re, um, recreating a different kind of trust, as Hubert was saying. But how do you do this in the here and now when there is war? Um, perhaps, Caleb, you can say a quick word about this yeah. and maybe we can uh, look back to our other um, discussions to, to... Yeah, I will. Uh, and my answer is actually tied to what Alexandra said on collaboration. I believe alone it's difficult because we don't have the tools and capacities to do it as an individual, as an organization, as a, you know, even as a, as a state. So these elements of collaboration where different actors are working on different elements. I feel like that's where the key uh, sits, yeah. Thank you, Alexandra. Um, thank you so much, Calypso. Um, well, I, I was thinking back to what you said about you know freedom of expression and reconciling it with fact-checking. And I have to say that even here and now, using the current NLP engines like GPT-3 that Hubert uh, mentioned, for instance, and some others as well, we can have much more refined systems that really tell us a bit more about the content of what is being said, right? There's plain misinformation can be distinguished. And I'm not saying that it's going to be a super reliable um, thing to do, but actually ourselves as a team, we are already working on something like that. We are trying to create more nuanced systems that are checking facts while at the same time are trying to comprehend the nuanced ways in, people, in, which, in which people speak because maybe fact checking is more of a spectrum than it is just of a binary thing, right? So I think that has to be understood. And um, we have some very interesting technologies ready for that uh, as well. Well, thank you. Um, indeed, it's wonderful to know that your team is on it. And I'm sure we'll do brilliant work, which will also bring lessons for the way forward. I know, Uber, you have to, to, to run off too, Alexandra. I, I know you have to run up at 7.30. Uh, Uber, you, would you, and then I'll give the last word to Laurie, but Uber. Um, th thank you. Perhaps just uh, last comments because you, you questioned this idea of how can we actually use AI to, to rebuild trust or, or to, to, to support this. And um, I think it touched upon a very important point, which is we, we tend to use the expression uh, in AI ethics, the trustworthy AI, uh, it was in many documents. I think it's an awful expression because it doesn't mean anything to me. Um, it, of course, we need to define what do we mean by AI, do we mean specific technical systems, we mean the community of researchers, but most of the time what we mean by AI is a specific kind of algorithm. And as I said, like an algorithm cannot be trusted because we only trust human beings. 
We only trust something that has a moral agency. We only trust something or somebody that can actually betray you. Um, and so what we should talk about uh, when we talk about AI is either reliance or loyalty. We, we're looking for a loyal algorithm that does what we expect it to do. And so the, the whole question of, uh, around trust, and I will just end up on this one, is that I don't think technology has to be trusted because it cannot by nature, to, to my perception of, uh, of it. However, it can also help us to um, encourage people to develop habits, as you said, uh, more virtuous habits. And uh, it's not because you cannot trust somebody who's uh, all the time under surveillance. Um, if I want to trust Caleb and I have videos all around him, um, CCTVs, this is not called trust, it's called surveillance. Uh, so he has no, no more choice than just doing what I, what I expect. But if he knows he's under surveillance most of the time, he may also develop specific uh, habits that on the long run may help have together a better relationship even when surveillance is not here anymore. So that's just to say that I hope these systems uh, can help us build more virtuous behaviors for, for the whole society. Indeed, I, I, I tend to call this uh, not uh, blind trust, but binding trust. I mean, you, you, you trust because you interact, uh, but then you let this interaction leads you to, um, to indeed create more spaces. Um, so indeed, uh, and this idea, uh, Hubert, that um, you cannot trust someone, something that cannot betray you is something we need to think about. It's not clear to me that um, AI can't betray you um, since you speak of loyalty, but that's the beauty of our conversation. It opens up all sorts of, of, of new spaces. Uh, and, and now I will give the last floor uh, to you, Laurie. Thank, thank you very much. Caleb has been talking a lot about co cooperation, not just a single actor. And I, I think it's been so, sort of the uniting theme of our whole whole discussion here, at, or at least one of, one of them. There is no sil silver bullet, at least I, I have not yet encountered one, one to, this, to this issue. We are developing different te technological tools, working, developing different societal, societal approaches. And I think the, the key how to survive in this network, networked world is, is to d develop networks, correcting disinformation and, and fighting on the, on the, on the, on the, on the side of, 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 of correct information, if you, if you will, and, and creating trust in the society. And in this particular case of the war in Ukraine, frankly, I think the, the worst also in the, in the field of disinformation is yet to come. So far, the, at least the European part of the world has been very united in its horror in the, in the first month of the, of the war. But those moments of unity never last forever. And it's certain that there, there will be new, new and redoubled efforts to try, try and sow divisions and, and create mistrust within, within also on the, on the UN level and on, on, the, on the European level. So we, our work is, will be more, more needed than ever in the, in the coming weeks and months. Well, in, uh, Laurie, thank you for, for these last words because they really speak to what we hope and believe is, is our mission at Global Peace Tech and with these uh, uh, Peace Tech Hub uh, series to indeed create networks uh, among all stakeholders, working with Edmond, working with our colleagues, and indeed working globally. And this is why it's so important to have Caleb he here with us today, because if the Ukraine work uh, proves, um, shows, demonstrates something, is that these networks, um, those for good and those for bad, are global, that the spillovers are uh, if immediate, um, and that in the real world, networks happen, uh, networks of trade and supply chain, and then they get amplified and magnified or disempowered um, by, by the world we have been talking together about for the last uh, hour and a half. Um, so we want to think about these issues globally and indeed about the role of networks uh, in uh, providing solutions, providing a landscape, a human landscape at the end of the day, not a technological landscape that can make these technologies serve us and serve peace. 
So on these words, I'd like to thank all of our four um, speakers and discussant, including Alexandra, who had to leave us, and very much looking forward. Um, also, I would like to thank um, all our participants, those who are still online, as well as Michele and Lucia, who've been helping behind the scene, and my colleague, uh, Andrea Aranda, who is co-leading uh, the, 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 this project. Um, so on these words, I'd like uh, you to, ev everyone who is online, to keep looking for our next um, Peace Tech series. Uh, and I wish you a very good and excellent evening. Thank you very much. <laughs>